Hi everyone, and welcome to my video introducing the Kodak Vest Pocket Autographic 127. A few months ago I did a video on my Raleigh Flex Old Standard and commented that it was the oldest camera that I owned at the time. Uh, the oldest camera I've ever owned is a Kodak 1A from 1917. I no longer have it. Uh, then a month or so ago I did a video on the Kodak Brownie Number no. 3, which was my new oldest camera. Well, literally the day after I filmed that video, I got this camera, and it's now my new oldest camera. So, uh, it is not the oldest camera I've ever owned. It has the date 1918 on the back. HG, that was the first owner. I got this from the second owner. And um, so it's had surprisingly few owners for a camera of its age. Now, the Vest Pocket, Kodak, uh, the Kodak Vest Pocket, is a folding camera and it's what's called a strut folding camera so we're looking at the bottom right here and you can see that as it folds out there are these struts here that uh, are the folding mechanism there are two types of folding cameras there's a strut folding camera and then there's a platform folding camera where the platform folds out, folds out and then the lens slides along the platform so this is a strut folding camera and very gentle with it. The bellows has some pin pricks in it along the edges, but it still takes photos. Took an entire roll of it and not a single one of them was in focus. So I'm going to try another roll and see if the camera screwed up or if I did something wrong. I think it was user error. Uh, anyway, it has uh, no, no light meter well predates light meters. It's a very simple basic mechanical camera. This is actually a very nice version of this camera and we'll get into that in a minute. It has shutter speeds of time which is where you push the shutter release down and release your finger and the shutter stays open until you push the shutter again. Bulb which is where the shutter stays open as long as you have your finger depressed on the shutter. 1 1 25th of a second and 1 50th of a second. It has an offset viewfinder that has approximately 90% coverage. I'm guessing that based on comparing what I remember seeing through the viewfinder to the blurry out of focus images I got back after I uh, shot some frames with it. And it has no flash sync. So um, uh, it's really, you can use it inside with an off camera flash that doesn't sync up to the camera but uh, really this is uh, best suited for outdoor use. And what I think I did wrong when I was using it before was I wasn't, I don't think I was fully extending this like I just did. I think I was only partly extending it. Um, anyway, the target market for this camera, and this was the second, second model camera in this lineup. There was the Kodak Vest Pocket 127, which was the same camera as this, but did not have the autographic feature, which we'll get to in a minute. And uh, the target market for this was entry level. The camera was uh, six to ten dollars in 1916 for the standard model. In today's terms, uh, accounting for inflation, six dollars in 1916 had the same buying power as 130 dollars in 2012. Uh, this model was the special and it was twenty two fifty to twenty five dollars in nineteen sixteen dollars which would be uh... the same earning power as about five hundred and twenty dollars in uh... twenty twelve hasn't really held its earning power value uh, it has held its dollar price value because these are still worth about five to ten dollars well this one hasn't there are so many of these and they were built to last so most of the, many of them are still around and they don't rust it and we'll talk about why that is in a minute too. Uh, they were the smallest camera made to that point. In fact, give me just a second and I'll show you how small these are. Uh, so to demonstrate how small these are, I'm going to close this up here. Carefully, carefully, I, I really like this camera. It's pretty darn cool. Okay, so compacted. Here it is next to my Canon ELF. This is an SD 1100IS uh, Canon ELF. It's 8 megapixel. It's a nice small one. A little bit smaller than the deck of cards. 
you can see that this is not much bigger. Or, another comparison, there it is next to or underneath my Samsung Galaxy S3. You can see that the profile is, uh, or the face of it, is actually smaller than my S3's face. So that's pretty darn small. Width-wise, here it is next to my Canon ELF. I'll actually put the Canon ELF on top. You can see it's not much wider than the Canon ELF is. It is, however, substantially wider than the S3. Uh, just, you know, apples to apples there. But it's still, it was the smallest camera ever made up to, the, up to this point, and it is a very, very small camera. Previously, vest pocket cameras, you kind of needed a purse to carry around, or backpack. This was the first vest pocket, which really could fit in your vest pocket. Uh, it, it's even small, as I showed just now, it's even small by modern standards for a camera. Uh, I don't have a, I'm using my DSLR obviously, but uh, it is much, much, much smaller than my, my K7. It uses 127 film. Here's 127 film and a 127 film spool. By comparison, this is a 120 spool that's got just paper, no film on it. Here's a 620 spool, which is basically the same size as the 120. And here is a 35 millimeter cassette. Oh, my dinner's over boiling. And so you can see it's actually not, the 127 film is actually not much bigger than the 35 millimeter cassette. All right, dinner crisis avoided. Uh, it's not much bigger than the 35 millimeter cassette. But the images on these are much larger. This takes uh, four centimeter by six centimeter, I believe, images. And um, standard for 127 is four by four. Standard for 35 is two and a half by 3.6 centimeters. So it's a much larger image area uh, for much, much brighter and crisper images, even though it's basically the same size film container. It just takes many fewer photos per, per roll. Uh, it could use any 127 film, but it was specifically designed for autographic 127 film. So you can see the red window here on the back. As you would advance the film on this side, you'd take the picture, advance it to the next number, and then there was an iron stylus in here which, which is lost uh, on this one. You'd open this back up and then you would write a note on the paper backing with the iron stylus. It wouldn't actually write on the paper backing, but it would make the paper backing slightly thinner, and then you would hold it up to the light for a few seconds, three to five seconds, close that, and you would expose where you had written between it. So if you were to write, uh, you know, vacation photo, someplace cool, then it would say that on the back when you got your film back and you could remember what it was you'd taken a picture of, which which can be pretty useful. Or uh, It's similar to the, it's the actual, when, when you have it take a JPEG now with your digital camera and you get the EXIF data, that's the same. And uh, it is the original EXIF data right there. So these were made in the United States. I believe that these were all made, every single one of them in the U.S., in Rochester, New York, by Kodak. They were made from 1912 until 1926. The autographics didn't come along until a little bit later, so the really, really early ones, which are, which are fairly rare, do not have the autographic feature on the back. Um, and that, I think, was 1914. I think it's later in the video outline as well. These were preceded by a large number of Kodak folding cameras, the 1A, 2A, 3A, that were all really big. They took negatives larger than this camera. Uh, and then it was also concurrent with a lot of Kodak box cameras and other folding cameras, because this had a very long production lifespan. Uh, it was followed by more Kodak folding cameras. And this is just one in a long line of Kodak's folding cameras Kodak had so many different models that uh, if you really, really want to get into it, I uh, recommend you do so. There's a lot of interesting things to learn about Kodak cameras out there. Uh, one of the reasons that there are so many of these around, and that they have all generally held up pretty well, which 
is not so much the case for Kodak cameras of this age. Um, but these ones have held up very well is because they were made of stamped aluminum. So every metal component on the body is aluminum. So you'll get some green stuff around some of the joints once, once in a while. Um, which I mine had a little bit of green around here which was aluminum corrosion but I, I cleaned it off. But you're not going to get rust because aluminum doesn't rust. So these are not only small, they're lightweight and they don't rust and they last a very long time. The shutters in these, the Kodak shutters, and there were some other makes, makes available as well, but the shutters were very simple and long lasting so many of these still work today and they still take pretty good pictures too. In fact at the end of this video um, I will show you the photos that I take with the roll of film we're going to load in it a little bit later. Uh, let's see Okay, uh, so let's take a, take a look now at the various camera features and we're going to see what all this has. So we're going to look at the camera's front right now and I'm going to leave it closed for a minute because because uh, we don't need to get into the opening, we don't need to get it open back yet, uh, opened back up yet. But on the front we have the viewfinder eyepiece and the lens and the shutter. So you've got the aperture down here and the shutter control up here. Uh, you adjust your shutter from 125th bulb time to 150th. And then your aperture, this is an f7.7. It was a pretty high-end lens. Is it f7? I'm sorry, it's an f6.3. This was a very high-end high -end lens. f7.7 was standard. Down to f32-ish. Uh, then when we open it up inside, we'll open it up now and extend it all the way. Always makes me nervous to do that. Inside we have the viewfinder and this is what you would look through to see how you're framing the image. We also have the stand. So you could leave it on time and uh, go stand in front of the picture or you could just set it down for a longer exposure, activate the shutter, and then uh, you wouldn't get camera shake. And one thing about this, if you have one of these, your serial number is on the back of the stand. So this one, for instance, is 74006. To the best of my knowledge, these were serial numbered sequentially. And so out of uh, 1.75 million copies of this camera, uh, I believe this is number 74,006. I could be incorrect on that, um, but but it was I wasn't able to find anything that conclusively said one way or the other. But I found a few resources online that that said that speculated that that was the serial numbering system, just sequential numbers, and it does kind of make sense with the way that Kodak um, was numbering cameras back then. At any rate, uh, um, so that's the camera's front. Oh, and then you can see it also now that we have it open, you can again see the struts here and then the accordion bellows here. And this is the shutter release button. Did I forget to do something with the shutter? I sure did. Anyway. So and that's, sorry about that, I had uh, accidentally pushed. So one of these things about these cameras is your shutter setting has to be exactly on the setting that you want it to be, or the shutter will not close after you push the shutter release button. At least on this one it is. Old cameras develop personalities and interesting quirks, and that's one of this camera's interesting quirks. At any rate, uh, on the camera's back, uh, let's, I'm sorry, let's take a look at the camera's top first. Uh, this is the uh, this is the camera's top right here. You can tell it's the camera's top because when you adjust the viewfinder that's upward. And so the camera's top actually has the film advance, which is standard on, on most cameras now. We're familiar with the, advancing the film with the advance lever over here. And then it has the open and close button. So this is actually where the film gets loaded, gets loaded in through the top. And we'll take a look at how to load film a little bit later in the video. The camera's back, we have the red window for counting the numbers on your paper backing. And this comes off so that you can get to the back of the lens to clean it. Uh, 
and I have a devil of a time getting it off on this copy, but what you have to do is you put your hand on it and then you rotate it to get it off. And uh, this one, one of the other quirks about this old camera is that it does not really like the back to come off. And then you also have the autographic slot right here. On the camera's bottom, we've got, oops, uh, yeah, nothing. There's nothing on the camera's bottom. Okay, so. so there's not a whole lot to this camera in terms of bells and whistles and features. Very basic. Uh, in fact, basically as basic as you can get for a folding camera. Uh, so there are a few variants to this camera. Uh, and these variants exist because there was a 14 year production lifespan. So some of the variations can help you date how old your camera is. The first ones had square folded bellows uh, instead of modern style. This is a modern style of bellows folding. Square folding looks a little bit different. So if your bellows looks different than this, it might be one of the oldest uh, uh, autographics. Also, um, the autographic feature that I've shown you on the back here, that appeared in 1915. Oh, jeez. I hate when I do that stuff. So any of these that don't have the autographic, you can know automatically, predate 1915. That's when the production began on the autographics. And um, the... Um, uh, but the autographics went up for sale, I believe, in 1916. I think, I think production, if I remember reading correctly, started in late 1915. And an interesting thing about the autographic feature is apparently it was never really a huge selling point. Kodak made a big deal of it, but there are really very, very few negatives that, uh, in, in historical records that show that people used the autographic feature. So it was, might have just been one of those things that, hey, isn't this neat, and no one cares. In um, 1926, and then it sold into 1927, so for the last production year, the UK version of this camera included a Comper shutter and a Zeiss Tesser lens. Very, very sought-after model. Uh, they're the most expensive of these, and they still fetch decently good money, because they take excellent photos. The Zeiss Tester lens is spectacular on those cameras. I want to say it's an f4.5. It might be a little bit slower than that. That's coming from memory. Uh, and it's been about three weeks since I have wrote this outline. I've, as you can tell, had a bit of a cold or flu, and this is the first day I've been able to speak well enough to film a video in three weeks. At any rate, uh, Low-end variants of this camera, you can see that this camera has a leather finish. And it's not leatherette like modern cameras have, or newer cameras have. This is actual, actual leather. Um, so you can see that this has a leather finish. The low-end models with the f7.7 lens had an enamel, a smooth enameled finish. Other variants of that include what was called a Japan crackle finish, I think it was called. Uh, yeah, uh, a crackled or a Japan finish. And those were, uh, and that, instead of being smooth, it had what looked like texture, but I, I don't think it, I think it looked textured but wasn't, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, two primary variants of this camera, of the autographic, existed. And those were the standard and the special. This is the special. And the special had the leather, the standard had the enamel finish. Um, the, uh, both of the cameras, typically the special and the standard, included the Kodak number zero shutter and used a simple meniscus achromatic lens. So the lens in here that they, even though this is a better lens, it's faster by a little. Um, 6.3 instead of 7.7. .7. It's the same basic design, only slightly slightly larger. Uh, some variants, some of the older variants had the lenses. You can see here how the glass is in front of the aperture. Some of the older variants had the lens behind the aperture, and those had... <coughs> and those had 
chokes in the aperture, which prevented them from stopping down small, uh, wider than f11. Very slow cameras by today's standards. And so the, t the aperture scale on those typically says 1, 2, 3, and 4. F1 being uh, 11, 2 being F16, 3 being F22, and 4 being F32. Uh, other lens makers besides Kodak for these included Zeiss, Ross, Beck, Berthio, Cook, uh, and Bausch and Loam. The, the Zeiss had an F4.9 with 8 speed comper shutter. So is that 4.9, not F4.5? So for using this camera, the lens is a fixed focus camera, meaning you know, the lens is a fixed focus lens on most of these. On some of the high-end models, like the Zeiss lens model, there was an adjustable focus lens, but on the vast majority of, of the autographic 127s, the lens doesn't focus. So it's a fixed focus lens, and it focuses from 1.8 meters, which is about 6 feet, to infinity, no matter what, uh, uh, what you do. But you can control how much of that is in focus, how much of it is actually sharp, with your aperture. So having it stopped all the way down to 32, for instance, is going to give you a much deeper depth of field that's in focus. Having it open to uh, f6.3 is going to give you a focal range of, uh, assuming that 6 feet is in the middle, something about in the range of 4 feet to uh, let's see, 85 millimeters, 4 feet to probably 25 in that range, maybe maybe 18 but n not nearly as much as, as 32, which will give you 4 feet to infinity, or 6 feet to infinity in that range. At any rate, um, so that's, that's how you focus it. You focus it with the aperture, or you control your depth of field with the aperture. To load the film, open up the back here like this. So now we've got the back open. And it takes an empty spool, which you would get from your previous roll of film, as well as a new roll of film. Now this, this film actually is a re-spool. It's got 35 millimeter on it. Not that that's really vital to know. Um, but uh, this, the process is the same. So I'm going to put the leader through the, one, through the old spool. Wrap it up a little bit so that it's nice and tight. Make sure that it's uh, feeding onto there straight. Okay, and so this is going to take eight 40 by 60 exposures. And we're going to load it this way. The loading this camera is a little bit fiddly. That's one of the, the few complaints that users have about it. There's a couple of springs inside to keep things taut and so it takes a little bit of pressure to put it in. Now this side isn't quite closing all the way, so I'm going to advance the... F the I'm going to advance the winder. There we... nope, not quite. What? Oh, I know what I did. Dang it. Okay, so for 127 film, the spools have a nub end and a notched end. I put that in backwards. The notched end has to go towards the winding lever. Uh, all other spools that I've ever used, uh, 122, 124, 120, 116, they all have notches on both. Um, so 127, to my knowledge, is an outlier from, from what's normal for that. And we just turn that. There we go until it's in. Lock that. Now we can see in the back here we go. You can see that as I advance it the paper backing is advancing. I'm going to I got some po pointy fingers, pointy fingers, some dots, big dots, and the number one. There we go. Now, modern films are red sensitive in a way that the orthochromatic films that this camera was designed for were not. So, if you're going to use color film, and I learned this the hard way on my last roll, 
it's a good idea to take a piece of something and some scotch tape and cover it and make a little trap door over this. Uh, that's something that would be part of an old credit card, uh, a thick piece of card stock, something like that. You just have to block the light from getting to the red window so that it, the red light doesn't come in, seep around the paper backing and cause red con light contamination on the back here. Likewise, if you open this, light can get in through here now and can also contaminate the film. Um, and it would have done that in the old days too with the, uh, with the autographic film, but the autographic film was much less sensitive to light, so it would, would have taken a lot longer then than it does now for the film to be contaminated by light. So as you take your pictures, and this is actual film, so I'm not going to advance all the way through it like I normally do, but as you take your pictures, the paper gets taken up on the take-up spool. When you're done, you advance it the whole way, and then you take out the take-up take out the take up spool and load your next roll exactly as I showed you. Um, 127 film will come with a, a sticky tab or something like that to keep the paper rolled over for you to take to to keep the the backing tight until you have a chance to get it developed. The um, so that's really that's that's it for this camera. That's it for how to use this camera and its features. A couple of notable facts. Um, there are two famous people who I could find who we know for a fact used this camera. One of them being George, uh, Charles Lindbergh who took a lot of photos with uh, an autographic 127 from his from his plane. And also George Mallory who uh, was lost on Mount Everest. And If you do any kind of um, internet searches for this camera you'll find a number of references to the George Mallory missing camera might prove he made it to the top of Everest first. Um, lots of people really seem to, to hone in on that as being pretty great and it is interesting and it, it would be fantastic if that turned up uh, but it hasn't yet. Uh, and if it does who knows if the film would actually be developable or not anymore. Uh, at any rate uh, last thing, a few things not to do. Uh, don't touch the lens. Old lenses have much softer optical glass than modern lenses, and even though they're not coated, um, they're more susceptible to damage from things like cleaning or fingerprint acid, which can damage the, the, any, any optical glass. Uh, don't store your gear, uh, don't store your camera inside of your car because uh, in the heat it can do a lot of damage to the shutter mechanism, so it can the cold. Uh, it can also get oil. On the, oil on the aperture blade is not such a big deal with these old cameras, but it can really damage the shutter mechanism. And don't store your camera inside of a plastic bag or other closed container without desiccant, because that can lead to fungus and mold and mildew growth, which are really damaging to a camera. And don't let this camera get wet. Even though it won't rust, it does have components which can be damaged by water. So the last thing is remember your camera is a precision tool and as long as you treat it with respect it will continue to last at least 95 years in this case. Uh, cameras were built to last, especially some of these older ones and treating them with care will help make sure that that happens for a much longer time. Uh, at any rate, if this video was helpful please leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that um, the content I'm producing is, is helpful. It, please leave any comments or suggestion in the comments uh, section. I'm pretty good about getting back to those fairly quickly. If you have any suggestions for videos, please leave those in the comments as well. And uh, a number of my videos have come from user suggestions. And if I have the equipment and technical know-how, I'm more than happy to film a video based on one of your suggestions. And the last thing I wanted to say is thank you guys for watching.